think you should be hearing me now. Welcome everyone. This event is part of the series of EU side events at COP27 and is organized by Search for Common Ground, the International Committee of the Red Cross and by Conciliation Resources. My name is Matilda Fleming. I'm a senior policy manager at Search for Common Ground and I'll be your moderator. The focus of this event is at the intersection between the loss and damage agenda and conflict risks. A Stanford study estimates that climate change influenced up to 20% of armed conflict risk in the past century and anticipates that this influence will increase dramatically in the years to come. Today's crises, we know, are increasingly long lasting, recurring, complex and interdependent. And for the ones of you less familiar, the concept of loss and damage is used in the UN climate negotiations and refers to the permanent loss of repairable damage caused by the manifestations of climate change, including both severe weather events and slow onset events such as sea level rise and desertification, both topics that today's speakers will cover. Loss and damage has made it into the negotiations at COP27, COP27. And while the conflict and security aspect of climate change is not an explicit item for negotiations, we know that conflict affected settings are both exceptionally vulnerable to climate change and face very specific challenges in adaption and building climate resilience. As conflict experts and practitioners with this event, we want to shed light on what loss and damage looks like in practice in conflict settings. And at the same time, as uh, peace, so Constellation Resources and Search for Common Ground as peace building organizations, we also can't help to see climate change present an opportunity to bring together people across dividing lines to address shared challenges. We have three brilliant speakers with us today. We have Namita Katri, who's a diplomatic advisor at the International Committee of the Red Cross where she, among other things, leads on climate finance policy. And before joining the ICRC, she was a Fijian diplomat for 15 years. We have Dr. Kate Higgins, who's a policy and learning manager at Conciliation Resources, where she supports peace building capacities uh, across the Pacific. We also have Perry Tukwe, who's a project program coordinator at Search for Common Ground in Nigeria. He's a doctoral research fellow and a peace building practitioner with a current focus on the upcoming elections in Nigeria. You can interact with us through the Slido chat, which is that red section of, um, of uh, the swap card website and uh, through which you can get with the QR code that's showing right now. Um, so please don't use the sort of group conversation box at the corner of your of the swap card, but rather the Slido, um, Slido page. Um, and you can also vote for people's questions there. If you think someone else has asked a brilliant question, then just give it a, give it a like and it will be hiked up. And uh, after the presentations, we'll turn to to your questions. So so um, yeah, get ready on the on the Slido, please. But without further ado, I'll um, hand it over to Namita, who will be the first speaker. Thank you very much. Look, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, now, sitting back in Geneva after having been in Sharm for the first week, um, we as a humanitarian organization with a mandate to alleviate suffering in situations of conflict are at COP this year to really shine a light on the needs that we see in conflict affected places. And in particular, to note that one, these needs are urgent. Um, that people in places affected by conflict have the least adaptive capacity because conflict has weakened institutions, et cetera, in addition to the climate risk that they're also facing and any number of other uh, types of vulnerability. Two, that action, climate action is not getting to these people. And three, that we need contextualized climate finance to actually make the difference to the dignity of these people. So that's what we were doing. And um, as was noted uh, in the introduction to this event, uh, conflict doesn't really appear in the negotiation space at all. However, we have seen at this COP an increasing uh, amount of interest in what you can call the climate fair of all the different events at pavilions, 
about trying to understand this. Um, so I want to make three points in the context of this discussion about loss and damage in connecting climate and conflict. One, loss and damage is already evident. Some of the photos that you're going to see, that you're seeing now actually, um, are in areas we work across uh, Mali, Somalia, Iraq, that show you the kind of things that we see and that we need to respond to. So these economic and non-economic loss and damages are evident. They need specific and contextualized responses. And finally, that although we are seeing increased humanitarian needs and trying to respond in these places for the adaptive capacity of people, the resilience, and ultimately responding to loss and damages that they've seen, uh, it's beyond the scope of humanitarian actors to do alone. And we need people with the expertise on climate action to be able to come into these environments where they are largely absent and where humanitarians and peace builders are largely asked to do the work. Uh, I wanted to just speak to some of these some of the kind of things that we're seeing. So in a place like Somalia, which has been weakened by decades of conflict and fragility, we have had doubts which, droughts which have repeatedly forced people to move. Perversely, so have floods. So you see kind of the, the inability to plan for anything when you already have weakened capacity and you are struggling with hostilities. In the Sahel, an unpredictable climate and environmental degradation makes the survival of remote and Im impoverished communities more difficult each year. Coping mechanisms are radically eroded by violence and instability. And the same violence and instability makes international coordinated and coherent responses, climate action, all the less likely, particularly as climate action is currently framed amongst the rules that guide the disbursement of climate finance. In Yemen and Iraq, water scarcity, which challenges health, food, and economic security, is exacerbated by institutional weakness. Often conflicts harm the very ecosystems in which people survive, uh, on, on which people's survival depends. Notwithstanding, incidentally, international humanitarian law protections on the natural environment. And as we, you know, the average time that I, the ICRC spends in a conflict place is now gone to well beyond 36 years. So we're not talking about providing immediate and only emergency relief. We're talking about accompanying communities over decades and helping them build their adaptive capacity with weakened institutions around us and really trying to help um, allow people to live in some kind of dignity with some kind of dignity and I think I, I say this to make the link to the work that our peace building friends will also do. Um, I wanted to also speak about the specific, I said that my second point was going to be on specific and contextualized responses required. Um, if you look at the Paris Agreements, Article 8.4, which talks about the aspects that the Santiago network will need to look at to operationalize, you can see that the framing is done for stable environments. Um, they do mention adaptive capacity and resilience, and that is what we try to do. But when you start talking about things like pooled climate risk funds and insurance products, I can tell you those are never going to work in complex settings, right? Um, so we need to be able to look specifically at the needs of conflict areas if we are going to create responses that at all aim to meet those same conflict areas. Um, without a focus on addressing risk, on addressing the scale of action, on collaboration with local actors and really listening to communities and ensuring that they're part of the response. And by breaking through the silos between conflict and climate teams across institutions that disperse funding and in recipient states, we're not going to be able to um, find adequate responses to these. Uh, we we said as much in a submission we made to the um, uh, when submissions were called for to operationalize the Santiago network, and um, you should feel free to look at that. Um, and I also want to do a shout out a little bit to a piece of work. I spoke to four areas that need to be addressed to be able to ensure that climate finance um, 
not just for adaptation, but in any future funding facility for loss and damage to ensure that the same gap in conflict areas is not replicated for loss and damage that we will need to address. We have addressed some of these in a paper, uh, and I'm just giving you a link in the group chat to a blog I wrote last week, which summarizes this if you don't have the time to read the paper, which is also linked. And then the final point I want to make, uh, I referred to it earlier, but is that, which is that we see in the places that we work, the increased humanitarian needs that we are having to respond to over decades. Everything from immediate access to water to long-term water supply. These humanitarian needs need humanitarian responses. They also, and crucially, need multi-sectoral responses that can speak to the scale of the need and the type of systemic responses needed. Those are beyond the capacity of humanitarian actors. And so as much as loss and damage creates humanitarian consequences, framing it as a humanitarian issue will be insufficient. Um, and this is something that states will need to consider as they're making decisions this week on what to do about a loss and damage funding facility. I will stop there and hopefully um, come back if there are any questions, but I'm really keen also to hear from our peace building colleagues. Just one, one last point, um, sorry, is to say that there was a, a question uh, in the concept note, which about how we would tackle damage and mitigate conflict risks in communities. As a humanitarian, our job is to keep responding to the needs we see on the ground. Um, and we feel that the more we can help people live with dignity, the more secure they feel. It won't solve the problem, but I think we need to build better bridges between the work we do, the work peace building actors can do, and together to build bridges with the development and climate communities, which will be better able to give sort of the, um, the adaptive response needed. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, and just to for the audience, the, the paper that uh, Namita was referring to is called Who Gets What? How to Get Climate Finance Working for the People Who Need It Most. Um, so thanks for sharing that and for your very clear call out for a, a holistic response. I think it also begs the question of, of you know, what's standing in the way for that holistic response and, and how do we get that how does that really get get off the ground? But before we get there, I want to hand it over to to Kate Higgins from um, Conciliation Resources. Go ahead. Um, yes, thanks very much for having me. And um, it's really interesting to hear Namita's um, really wonderful presentation because I think I have very similar points to make, um, particularly around climate action not getting to who needs it and not repeating those mistakes with uh, with uh, loss and damage financing. Um, and this is drawing upon some of the lessons that we're seeing from communities who are facing the impacts of climate change in the places where we're working. Um, so, yeah, so I work for Conciliation Resources, which is an international peace building organisation. And we've been working in the uh, Pacific region for the last 25 years, working on sort of fairly traditional um, peace and conflict peace process issues. Um, about a, We work in partnership with a range of community leaders, civil society actors, faith leaders, um, government actors, uh, those who are committed to transforming conflict systems and building peace. It can be a variety of different people, and I don't know my categories really do them justice. And about a decade ago, uh, we started having these conversations. We're seeing climate change impacts all around us. What do we do as peace builders? And that's how we have come to start this work. So about three years ago, we began a climate change and conflict program that works in different geographies, noting that the Pacific region is incredibly diverse and the issues look very differently in, in different uh, areas. Um, today, I'll draw upon uh, a few, I guess, small stories from uh, some work we have, which is probably our most advanced work, which is in communities facing um, loss and damage in terms of the loss of their communities, the loss of their land, um, and really, really complex dislocation issues. But before I do that, to even start working on this climate change 
and peace building nexus, we started by developing a little bit of a, a framework to try and it's an imperfect framework um, to try and understand the conflict risks a little bit better and to try and delve into this complexity. And I thought it might be good to give a little bit of an overview first. Next slide, please. So the first one is um, around, um, you know, we all hear about climate change as a, a, as a threat multiplier um, to land and resource conflict. And this is really important in terms of what I will get to in, in a moment about how do we actually work with communities on this? Because it's really important to remind ourselves of those of us who work in the Pacific, it's easy, even easy to forget that the majority of land and resources are communally held um, and underpinned by very complex land tenure arrangements that differ from place to place. So working on issues of land and dislocation is going to be complex and different in every place. And so the last presentation around actually needing to have climate finance that is contextualised is, is really, really, really important for, for dealing with these issues. Um, second slide, next slide. Um, so dislocation, and this is really what we've been working on um, in terms of entire villages needing to relocate because of um, sea level rise and also, I guess, resource scare scarcity, but also, and even more probably prominent is people choosing it's too hard to rebuild after extreme weather events um, and the increase of urbanisation, urban insecurity and people not finding places in urban centres but uh, settling in very climate vulnerable urban informal settlements. Uh, maybe the next one slide please. Uh, violent conflict has been emerging in several places after extreme weather events um, and this is um, only going to set to increase. Um, also, it's really interesting when in every place we've worked, we've had it, both COVID, but also extreme weather events in every every location where we've worked in the last few years. And sometimes we we really need the humanitarian actors because some days we find that we are humanitarian actors on a given day and we're really not really sure what to do. And a lot of what we do is mediate between all the sort of um, sometimes chaotic responses that are going on and the inappropriate responses that are going on. And so that's one of the, the roles we find ourselves, or when I say we, us and our partners find ourselves in. Um, next slide, please. This is a, a really tricky one to talk about. Um, and it's really, you know, the state and, and Pacific Island governments and governments around the world are the assumed kind of key actor responsible for dealing with, um, but, you know, with climate change impacts, but often there can be tensions between communities and state institutions, as well as um, real um, resource and capacity issues on on the part of of governments. So you know, real real um, real real challenges in terms of in terms of that governance. And next slide, please. And this is what I really want to talk about, which is climate change intervention itself as a conflict driver. And we only have to learn the lessons from some development intervention where you have solar panels or seawalls or uh, mangroves uh, that have not been able to be planted because they haven't haven't been implemented, projects haven't been implemented properly. And so we, we can't have this happen with climate finance in whatever form that takes. So um, if we just next slide, please. Yeah. So some of the key issues that commonalities between places where our partners have been working. Um, uh, firstly, uh, you know, extreme weather events being one of them. Um, but what we've found is that there has been, there isn't a lack of resources given to the communities that we've, that our partners have been working in prior to working with our partners. There hasn't been a lack of projects or finances or funding but it hasn't actually been able to have the impact that the communities would like. And what they have really been struggling with is consultation or whatever this term consultation means. So in one case um, where uh, a village was resettled, women were not informed they were leaving their ancestral homes um, until you know, the week or days before, which caused 
incredible trauma, not to mention everyone forgot to build kitchens um, because women hadn't been asked about how the food was going to be made, even though entire local economies also had to be changed. These things were not discussed. In another case, a really complex um, land issue, uh, not related to sea level rise, but related to very, very different set of circumstances, um, the consultation looked like the community, like on the picture on the right here, sitting on the floor and people being and people coming in, sitting on chairs and telling everyone what was going to happen in a two hour meeting that I think we can agree is not a consultation. So I have a few recommendations about some radical administrative change and change to the machine, the machines of, of, of sort of external intervention and finance. So next slide, please. Um, we, we, of course, need to get finance to these communities who are suffering irrevocable loss and whether um, there's any kind of compensation that can account for the loss of ancestral homes. I don't think there is, but of course, something needs to be done, but it needs to be spent really, really wisely. So I have a few recommendations here. So the first one is to generate accountability through relationships and not through bureaucracy. Maybe project approaches aren't going anywhere, but are there other mechanisms? Can we change the energy we put into huge project proposals and monitoring and evaluation frameworks and actually put it into, into relationships? Can we have reporting through recording of meetings on smartphones? The world has smartphones. Um, and can we, can we stop using such um, exclusionary language? Can we stop saying beneficiaries and donors? Can we actually talk about um, people working together, you know, that I think I'm sure we, we put our heads together, we can really just change the energies into what we to a different form of accountability. And in um, what I've learned about working in the Pacific for the last sort of period of time is that accountabilities sit in a network of relations. Second is to transform our approach to time. So now we've saved time from all the paperwork and we've removed some bureaucratic burden. Um, we can give that time back to communities to, as Namita has pointed out, really listen, like really listen. Um, we can save money um, by making it stretch further. You can get rid of people like me having to come here and make these pleas. Um, I don't I don't need to have this job. The, can we put more trust and find other mechanisms for funding that can sort of cut out the middleman and actually make this stretch a bit further? Um, and there is a lot of work to be done here. Um, but, and, it, and it is very, very challenging, especially when you're talking about a lot of small scale communities. But if we're serious about stretching the money, we really have to have this conversation. Fourth is changing who the experts are. Of course, we need climate scientists and engineers and, um, you know, lots of innovative solutions, but there is a lot of knowledge about Pacific environments by those who live in Pacific environments. Um, so changing who the expert is and actually making communities the expert. I know we've talked about this a lot, but we have to keep making these arguments, if, you know, and keep, keep it up there. And finally, moving from consultation to dialogue. So as mentioned, consultation has been a major problem for the success of um, a whole range of programs, disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, um, you know, and conservation projects and so on. Um, and so they are taking a place, of course, to, um, in accordance with the worldview of the intervener and lead to top down and inappropriate ill fitting solutions. So what about a system where communities actually set the agenda um, community set the agenda and design how the process is going to go and then the outsider adapts to that rather than the community adapting the other way around. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yes, that's our part. I just wanted to um, say that we have, and this again is an imperfect and, and an, uh, an initial attempt to document some suggestions for how to engage with communities in um, Itake communities in, in Fiji, in rural Fiji on complex issues of dislocation. Um, and it was co-produced bringing together different knowledge systems with our partner who I put a photo of here. Um, so it's down, downloadable from the Conciliation Resources website. 
and um, it yeah it is it, it's a guide and it may start to offer some some solutions for actually tackling tackling loss and damage so as to tackle conflict prevention and I know I haven't spoken a whole um, uh, a lot about conflict prevention but if we can get this right then we can actually minimize the effect the conflict effects that that will likely occur. So I might just leave it there um, so that there's more time for questions, but thank you very much. Thanks, Gabe, and thanks for that call for radical, radically rethinking uh, how we do things, um, which with a clock ticking really fast um, is, is the urgent need. Um, I'm also seeing some questions come in on the Slido. So just a, um, uh, yeah, warmly welcoming all questions that that the audience might might have. Um, just jot them on Slido. The QR code is there on your screen. Now over to our last speaker, Perry. Please go ahead. I've adopted a few from um, what you said. My recommendation is that you said that the community and uh, um, the agenda. We can't really hear you, Perry. Um, I think there's some sound issue. Can you hear me now? I don't think it's better. I'm wondering if it was better before without your headset, but. Can you hear me? Now I think it's good, yeah. Okay, great. Um, sorry about that. So I'll just take a cue from um, one of the recommendations that um, Kate put forward, uh, where she um, noted that communities um, should um, assess the agenda, uh, which of course seems to be like a bottom top approach, which of course can be very, very lucid and in tune with realities. What well, as I speak to you currently in Nigeria, the community that would set that agenda, a greater number of these communities are underwater and that's flooding. Uh, that, of course, is closely related to what climate change is doing, and that would form the nucleus of my presentation um, this afternoon. So for example, in the last 20 years in Nigeria, the flooding has been a recurring decimal, um, as I speak to you. And while the government has paid lip service to this, this, of course, has been like a cog in the wheel of progress um, in driving the development trajectory um, in Nigeria. In the last three months, um, it got to a climax where we had over 33 states with over 500 communities you know, flooded, um, as I speak to you um, right now. Uh, while there might be um, humanitarian efforts you know, going on at the moment, um, it's just like a dip in the ocean. Um, a lot of all this is occasioned by what's happening in Nigeria, where we have like the poor drainage infrastructure, and of course, the near absence of dams, of course, which of course will serve as, you know, mitigating measures, you know, to measure water control. And right now, the cause of what's happening in Nigeria right now is the fact that we have that overflow from the Lado Dam, you know, in Nibiru, Cameroon, that has pushed to the countries. And this, of course, has created a lot, a lot of problems, which has left in its wake losses of lives and properties, and of course, a huge humanitarian burden. If we look at data, for example, from uh, the Federal Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, you would see that um, over 480 homes are partially damaged. You know, livestock, livelihoods, you know, right now are, are gone with the water, about 612 dead at the moment, which of course is not pleasant. Um, and, and a lot around that, you know, it's, it's really, really, really um, painful. If we take, for example, in my fourth slide, you can see a resident of um, Yenegua. Yenegua is the capital city of Bayelsa State. Bayelsa State is in South, South um, Nigeria. Uh, it's an oil producing state. And that's the picture of a resident. That's a water level, you know, in a, in a city room um, is also affected uh, by the floods. This of course has also led to a lot of people, you know, seeking higher grounds, you know, and living these flood prone areas, which of course comes with a lot of waterborne diseases, you know, um, and a lot of that. What now is a twist to this? Um, Nigeria prepares for National Assembly, presidential and off-cycle state elections next year. 
and this rising waters is coming at the time, you know, when the electoral body, um, the Independent National Electoral Commission is wrapping up plans, you know, to conduct its elections. Um, as I speak to you right now, the implication of this flood, as I speak, is the fact that a lot of people stand, you know, to be disenfranchised and might not be able, you know, to exercise their franchise, as a lot of them, um, with INEX still basic technology, a lot of them still have like their polling units where their homes are. And right now, a lot of their homes are flooded and they have left these particular places to seek shelter, you know, in higher grounds and particularly in IDP camps. Um, that, of course, might be impossible. The question by now arise as a result of the fact that is the electoral body looking at creating, you know, polling units around, you know, uh, these IDP camps? Well, as I drive this conversation, there has not been any concrete plan uh, for the electoral body to put this, and this of course now serves, you know, as one of the adverse effects, you know, of flooding, particularly around Nigeria. But I'm also going to dive into some of the implications of these rising waters occasioned by climate change and how it's going to serve as a cog in the wheel of progress, you know, for national elections um, next year. Where I have, I mean, the flood has left in its wake a lot of broken infrastructure. And INEC, which of course is a statutory electoral commission, um, relies a lot on road transportation. But with this flood right now, there has been, you know, a lot of damage done to road transportation around. And um, government right now is looking at stopgap measures, you know, to put in place, you know, all of this infrastructure. Whether or not this will be ready from now till February um, leaves a lot to be desired. But this, of course, you know, puts a plug as well as um, in the resources of main materials, you know, as the plan um, for, for the elections. A lot of, for example, interstate roads, you know, particularly in the southern part of Nigeria, you know, have also um, been affected by these rising waters um, right now. Another implication also um, is the fact that there has been um, a lot of uncollected permanent voter cards. Uh, right now, um, as of October, we are having uh, 5 million uncollected cards and a lot of, no greater number of states with huge numbers um, are also affected by this flood. If not addressed as swiftly as possible, this development will snowball into voter apathy, you know, at the elections um, next year. There's also another part of uh, the conversation as regards uh, the climate change uh, development nexus and how, you know, this particular um, activity can also um, has also be a source of conflict and has led to losses and damages. And that is a desertification. Now desertification um, is when land uh, degradation occurs in dry and arid areas. Uh, this of course is induced by climate change and can also be defined you know, um, as loss of vegetation. Now this discourse is woven at the fact that a lot of desertification you know, take place in the northern part of Nigeria. So if we're going to snowball this right now into commerce, it also means that um, young headers, who of course own cattles um, in Nigeria, would always want to look for green vegetations and where there's a lot of water, you know, to feed their cattle so that their cattle are fertile enough for them to sell. And of course, you know, their cattle provide meat, you know, and beef. And Nigeria, of course, um, in, the, in the data available, seems to be one of the 10 states across the world, you know, that consumes a lot of meat. But right now, induced by climate change, we're seeing a lot of desertification, particularly in the north, to ensure that their cows and cattle are fertile enough and get a lot of water. There's now a lot of migration from the northern part of Nigeria, you know, into the southern part of Nigeria. Uh, this is also to add that in Nigeria, um, Nigeria doesn't have ranches, you know, where these cattle can be domiciled in a particular location, you know, and have this um, technology-driven ranches, you know, to provide for them. So what happens is the fact that we have headers, you know, moving as nomads from a particular location to the other, you know, in search of water and green vegetations, you know, for their cattle to feed um, their cattle. Now, this is not um, a controlled arrangement. So they just bump in for examples, you know, into farmlands in the south where they get a lot of water and green vegetations. Um, this, of course, draws the anger 
of farmers in the South because, I mean, there should have been like a prior, you know, understanding that they're going to be expecting this, in quotes, August visitors, you know, into the environment. These two relationships between farmers and herders have snowballed in very catastrophic uh, dimensions where we have also had loss of property, loss of lives um, also. As peace builders, for example, Search for Common Ground uh, has also come in, particularly in Southern Nigeria, to see how this gap is closed and to ensure that because meat consumption uh, doesn't choose a particular location, that sort of has to be, for example, the need for farmers and headers, headers who, of course, are nomads, you know, and have traversed the country and probably found the spots in southern Nigeria to be able to, you know, to feed their cattle, to have a sort of symbiotic relationship and coexist amongst themselves. Um, this, of course, leads to initiatives put up uh, by South for Common Ground, of course, using um, its exceptional common ground approach, you know, to be the middleman, you know, between these farmers, you know, and headers. So what, for example, the discourse around peace building, uh, the peace building conflict nexus, particularly in Nigeria, is the fact that um, Central Common Ground as an organization would look towards, you know, building collaborating efforts, you know, and, you know, putting um, snowballing activities that would ensure that there's a win-win situation um, instead, of course, you know, dwelling on the adversarial um, approaches. So when one was to look at this, for example, the conversation, the extended conversation right now as the world um, looks at uh, COP19, you know, for solutions and answers, uh, the former two speakers, the previous two speakers have uh, spoke about is the fact that there's, of course, a need for um, climate finance also, particularly. Uh, there's a conversation, for example, that the South bears the brunt of a lot of um, adverse effects of climate change, you know, greenhouse emissions, you know, and a lot of that. But as peace building organizations also support governments, you know, in their activities, there's also now, as a part of recommendation, the need or uh, the need for a lot of climate governance, you know, systems set up to ensure that, you know, the relationship, particularly uh, between the North and the South is actually very strengthened and also to ensure that at this time, even with the adverse effects of climate change, every side wins. Thank you. Great, thank you for that, Barry. Um, I see some exciting questions popping up in, in the Slido and I think we'll we'll turn there now. Um, maybe first of all to Namita, how, yeah, how do we make this cross-sectorial holistic response work? What needs to change? And then there was also a question about whether there are specific actors that you see do this in a, in a good, or if you have examples of, of this working well. Um, yeah, that, that would be the question uh, for you. Thank you. So th thanks very much. Um, we address some of these issues in our paper and I'm not forcing everybody to go and try to read that. I will try to answer it. Um, Look, we don't have all the answers, but I think we need to start trying. And how do you make uh, multi-sectoral responses possible? I think that's a question rightly put to, to myself as a representative of a humanitarian organization that's present in, you know, 80 countries, etc. And yourselves as peace, peace builders working in communities at very local levels as well. Because the solution we're beginning to see, it needs to work from both ends. At our end, those of us who have the access and we uh, the icrc also have access to areas that are not controlled by government governments um well, those of us who have access to places affected by conflict and know how to work in these places must find ways of sharing our information our knowledge and our assessments at least for the icrc i can't speak for you guys but for us we do all of our work based on an assessment of the needs we see on the ground these needs will include needs arising out of climate risk. Things that our colleague Perry has just spoken about in terms of pastoralists, agriculturalists, or the kind of tensions that, that arise. The assumption on the other side, or if you want to call it the other side, but along the spectrum, let's say, the, by development and climate actors, is the risk of operating in, in conflict affected places is too high. You know, if it's the UN, the Department of Safety and Security will not allow UN personnel to go to these places. But I think some, some of that can 
be mitigated through simply our sharing of knowledge to bust some myths about risk. And then where there are risks, some of these organizations will have to accept a higher risk appetite and different fiduciary requirements to operate in conflict. Because if you have the same requirements that you do for South Africa or a country that is phenomenally stable, you will never operate in conflict affected places. And if you think that by our reckoning, about 75 million people in the world live in areas not controlled by government, outside of government controlled areas. That's 75 million people that even if the capital of a country is stable, you will never reach because that capital does not have reached to these difficult to reach places. So it needs to work both ways. On the one side, we have to do more to say, this is how we think we can work better. And not just sharing the knowledge, but perhaps also creating better operating and operational collaboration, which is to say, when you peace builders or we humanitarians are working in the community, we are working with a view not just to meet the need we're seeing right in front of us, but with a view to creating an enabling environment to allow others to come in if it is a place where sequencing is possible to sequence or to build on, even if we have our conflict analysis tells us that perhaps the conflict will flare up again or something, but we need to be able to build, help build that enabling environment. So it's not just a call to states and the board of the Green Climate Fund, which it also is. Green Climate Fund needs to find ways of figuring out fiduciary and risk frameworks that will allow the disbursement of climate finance into conflict affected and extremely fragile places, but it is equally an ask to us. There we go. Thank you, that's encouraging. Um, Kate or Perry, any any reflections on this, how we work together with humanitarians, with I think the climate change community, with um, development organizations. The peace building world is community is, is rather small at the end of the day, even if it has in many places, um, yeah, the type of access that, that Namida was talking about just now. I don't know who, who of you wants to come in on that. I can offer a brief thing. I mean, it's really interesting, humanitarian needs, um, sort of community harmony, peace, as it might be spoken about in the Pacific, uh, local development needs, subsistence needs. Uh, these are all something that communities will talk about in as part of a whole. It's really us and our sectors that make the distinction sometimes. Um, so I think that's always really important to remember and, and a place where we can start. I absolutely see how, um, you know, peace building and humanitarian actors can complement each other. And, and I'm not, and it's not to say that there isn't that happening already um, in terms of sort of collaboration in, in different spots, but yeah, definitely, um, definitely can be improved and we do need to look at ourselves um, and you know, and we, we are challenged by this as peace builders in, especially in this climate space where, you know, requests are community development requests and, and humanitarian requests. And, you know, people say you can't eat peace. And this is, um, you know, this is a real challenge because we don't want to step on toes and we're all so caught up in um, a very rushed, busy world where we have promised to deliver, we, you know, we, we're working on this delivery model, um, that it's really hard to find time to, for meaningful collaboration and we need to get a lot better at that. Thanks. Perry, any, any thoughts on that collaboration? Obviously, there is a lot of sort of HDP nexus work going on. I'm thinking the additional layer of, um, of collaboration also with um, environmental actors, um, climate investors, that type of, of, of thing. Yeah, I mean, um, KIT actually captures the essence, you know, on um, the collaboration between um, humanitarian and, and peace building. Um, the idea, for example, is to see how, you know, all of all these collaborative efforts, you know, can snowball into activities of mutual interest and also particularly safeguarding the environment. And what we need to do also is like our strategic partners, you know, um, and how we support a lot of um, initiatives. The idea is to escalate these conversations 
and to ensure that we get um, real action plans, you know, on earth action plans on this, you know, and if there are government, there are weak government policies, what we need to do is to support, you know, and hold us together. So yeah, um, it has been well captured already. And uh, this would like to see, you know, in the coming days, particularly, you know, as the adverse effects also of climate change um, doesn't seem, you know, to be winding down. Uh, we should hold on together and make sure that we can actually put things and get it working. Thank you. I have two questions for Kate here, I think, or at least one, no two. Um, what role should the corporate actors play when it comes to accountability and compensation and dealing with the consequences of their operations in conflict affected areas? And Related, perhaps, um, you're re referencing to conflict insensitive climate investments, I think, in your presentation. Uh, but how can we make climate investments conflict sensitive? Yeah, I'm not sure my answer to the first question is very uh, <laughs> um, full, shall we say. Um, so, in a lot of the really conflict affected places um in the sort of southwest pacific oh, it's not the whole pacific that i'm sort of speaking of here um the main corporate actors are within capital cities and in rural areas where a lot of the population lives it's a mixture of semi-subsistent and cash crop kind of economies um and exchange economies there are of course, retail stores, I would ex describe them more as services than as corporates. And the main corporate actors are the extractive industries and, and fisheries. And the extractive industries are having a multiplying effect on the environmental degradation caused by climate change. And so I think if you look at um, corporates that way, um, in it's a very, very, very tricky um, question, not in terms of only mining, which is extracting, um, but, you know, sometimes actually quite important minerals that are needed as part of a, a green transition, but the, the environmental degradation and the conflict impacts are always going to happen. So how you mitigate them, whether you say no in really some, some areas. So a coral atoll, do you need to completely ruin everyone's gardening spaces by mining it for bauxite for, with strip mining? Is there an alternative on a really small atoll um, to, to mining? So I think corporate actors starting to be a little, <laughs> a little bit more respectful of the dignity of, um, of, of these communities. I mean, that's a, a really big ask, but it is always going to be, you know, a key conflict driver. Um, on the issue of conflict um, sensitivity, it's it's sort of in some of the recommendations, although of course I have not made it explicit, which what makes it a really good question. Um, it's actually a recognition of the system, the, the social system in which you're entering into the intervention, you know, who the actors are, who the people are, who what the different institutions are, not just assuming there's one institution and it's the village headman. It can be churches it, it, for the Pacific particularly. Um, and slowing down and listening and actually working, working out um, so much uh conflict driven by by inadequate interventions could be avoided by just giving it some time and 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 having people that can um you know listen and and map out what's what 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 it is the context that you're actually entering into and civil society is a really important bridge in in doing this um as are you know different types of community community institutions such as churches Thanks. Namita Perry. May I? Yes. Yeah. I, I just wanted to make one additional point to what's just been made, because I think um, an understanding of the social structures that you are entering in is key. It's central. And I thank you for that. I think on the project design side also, there needs to be a little bit more thought. And, and here I'm thinking particularly of imagining places where let's say we as humanitarians and peace builders have created an enabling environment for a climate actor to come in 
in the project design, how do you create a project that accounts for conflict? So unlike a stable setting where you say, okay, here are the milestones. You know, we have, I don't know, uh, a seawall that is no longer adequate to keep the king tides at bay in, in the Pacific. And I love hearing Kate speak about my home country, by the way, it's great. Um, but if that's fine in Fiji and Suva along, along the seaside, if you need to build a higher seawall, you're not likely to have interruptions other than perhaps due to, I don't know, a cyclone or something like that. But in conflict settings, hostilities can affect and interrupt projects. You have to be able to build these in. So call them crisis modifiers or call them whatever you want. These do need to be taken into account when designing programs and accounting for it. And often for the big actors who are allocating finance to support action in certain places, you have, they're dispersing millions and millions of dollars. But in the kind of situations that we find ourselves, you're doing community action. Now, I'm not saying that in Mali, you don't need a whole Mali-wide action, which is a billion dollar project, but you may also need something in the communities affected by Lake Magibine or Fagibine, which is now disappearing. So for that scale and for a project in as unstable places as that, you also need to administer it differently. So rather than having one person responsible for 10, $3 million projects, you might actually need just one person following just this one program because it's going to need more regular daily support. Because otherwise, it's very easy to prioritize the bigger ones in stable settings and say, well, that project just failed. Yeah. I'll stop there. Thank you. Terry, any thoughts on, on, on um, the role of corporates or um, on conflict-sensitive conflict climate investments? Yeah, I mean, so conflict sensitivity uh, um, in this is actually very, very tricky. Um, if not well handled, for example, can even snowball into other conflicts, you know, particularly from the one that I just started. And, you know, in the sort of approaches that we, we carry out and the sort of interventions that we, you know, we also execute and implement, you know, around policy initiatives, you know, and other, um, other givings, you know, around climate change, it's just always very important you know, to actually include um, the conflict sensitivity part to ensure that probably like all sides are carried along. And like I said earlier, you know, it doesn't snowball, you know, into uh, um, something else. Particularly also for the fact that, you know, when, if we locate this discourse around climate finance, um, there's a need for inclusivity, you know, for all sides, you know, all the times. Um, around elections, we would like to always say that um, you have to be inclusive. You have to carry everyone along, people living with disabilities, um, IDPs, women, youths, you know, we can, you know, take that same sort of structures and platforms, you know, and also drive the conversations around, you know, um, corporate entities and, you know, climate finance to ensure that everyone is kind of long. When once this happens, then it will now be like holding hands together to ensure, you know, uh, that, you know, the two hands work together. And then, you know, the conversations can actually be more lucid and you have one general focus. Thanks for that. Um, Slido is still open for, for the audience. Um, we still have a couple of minutes on the clock. Um, Perry, I see a question for you here on what you've learned from your programming to bring people together around the consequences of climate change, which I guess refers to uh, farmer herder work, for instance. Any, any sort of key learnings for other sector, perhaps, um, that, that you would want to share? Yeah, for example, uh, the key learning is, is um, so the successes that, you know, have um, been identified, particularly in the relationship with, you know, the farmer and headers. Um, the idea is it has to be initiatives and programs that speak directly to the people. This, of course, is synonymous with um, what Kate said earlier when she said, um, and as I um, rephrase, communities should set the agenda. So we had, for example, for the, the idea around the success of the farmer header relationship, you know, around their pastoralism and climate change is the fact that there are levels of interventions and there are also levels by which, you know, these stakeholders have come together, you know, and present a united force. So, for example, 
It starts with um, local initiatives for um, at the local level with the communities, which is sort of like the base, you know, called uh, this community security architecture dialogue. You know, so when once those issues are brought to the table, for example, what are the issues that pastorally suffer, you know, that actually puts a hole in the relationship with headers? The two parts come together in that meeting, they put it out and they drop action plans. The ones that they can handle at that meeting now escalates, you know, to the state level where we now have what we call the peace architectural dialogue. So that dialogue now involves policymakers, um, statutory uh, um, civil society stakeholders, you know, governments, ministries, departments, and agencies, who of course will now take a lot of all these recommendations and new learnings, you know, upward into bills, into motions, you know, into policy brief and all of that. So the base and the new learning, for example, is the fact that number one, the community should set the agenda. No one should be, for example, you know, up there and setting agendas and models and setting up structures without carrying, you know, the community along. And like I said earlier also, the second part is the fact that all sides, it has to be as inclusive as possible. The women should be carried along, the youth should be carried along, uh, people living with disabilities should be carried along, you know, and all other, you know, forms of that. When once this is done, then this can actually, you know, go in a long way to particularly know what the people want and how to solve the problems in tune with the realities that they face. Thank you. Kate or Namita, any key learnings you want to share in, in the few minutes remaining? Maybe I could just go quickly. I mean, this is something that um, really emerged in, in some of our work. Um, and it was almost unintentional. So that's that's quite nice. I think we've always had a an eye open and a, a, a genuine genuine willingness to try and make our peace building in, inclusive so that the most amount of people can actually experience peace or relative peace. Um, but sometimes it's really quite hard to know how to how to do that. And so what we found was listening to people, working with people, within how they wanted to work, we slowly were able to expand spaces for talking outwards so that there was confidence building and trust building, even internally, even between sort of different identities within a place, and then creating um, platforms really slowly and very deliberately with, with other sort of external actors, including addressing some things that had gone wrong. And um, you know, it's not a criticism of governments in, in any way at all, um, because the capacity to be able to engage um, with communities in a way where communities are leading and speaking, it took so many meetings to be able to get to that point where the community was sitting on a stage and government was sitting in the audience. And um, so, so I think our work has enabled bringing together people who would normally be criticising each other or judging each other and um, to talk about the common challenges, which of course are in some ways, you know, a cyclone is kind of apolitical. It is something you can have common ground around. I mean, the actual cyclone itself, not the response and, and all the, the politics that can occur, of course, but the, the actual event itself. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's been one of the, the biggest learnings from our work and the importance, and I think this is where CR sort of comes in. It's not holding these this knowledge or this technical peace building kind of, um, you know, uh, knowledge, although we do, of course, have some of that. Um, it's really around our ability to sort of as an international, and I wish the world wasn't structured this way, but it is to sort of create spaces that can bring all these different people together. And that's what we really intend to do around climate change going forward. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's time to wrap up. I've uh... I've heard a lot of convergence around product design needing to take conflict into account, around financing modalities needing to take conflict into account, fiduciary requirements, um, risk management, that type of thing. And this thing about just because it's hard and risky doesn't mean it's not needed and it can't be done. It's just harder and potentially a bit riskier, but how do we manage that risk? 
So with that, those words, I'd like to thank my panelists very, very much. Thanks everyone for listening in and uh, hope you have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.